This is Dave Monk, the Prairie Monk, WEFT Champagne, 90.1 on your FM dial. And Dave on the board. We, have visitors. we uh, should mention, Scott, okay, today's uh, date, today uh, is the 17th, 17th, do I remember that correctly? Okay. We do this because yeah. we, we get mixed up. April the 17th, uh, two, uh, 20, 2000 and in the Big Prairie 16? Rivers. Yeah. So we have guests, uh, and Carol Hayes is the major guest today because she's the, the executive director of Prairie Rivers. Her husband is... Scott Hayes, and, and he was here last week spouting on the Sangamon River, and uh, that's very good. We have that, that, that was up on the, uh, the uh, I don't know whether I sent you a, a contact with it, but we have a, a link to that program, it's on YouTube. Okay. So uh, I was, I usually start off with a few things that are local, but first of all, let me introduce the two of you, husband and wife. It's very nice to see a team. That often teams get to do things. In the past, we used to have father and son or uh, family things, and it hasn't happened. It's kind of morphed into being very independent. But uh, having teams is, is kind of nice. Well, we, we are quite a team between the two of us and our two daughters who are very active also in policy world and politics, so uh, we've been doing this together, really, since we've been together, so about 25 years, ah, and oh. uh, we just continue to uh, take on new issues together. So tell us a little bit about your background. And uh, well, I've lived in um, the Urbana-Champaign community for uh, about 20, let's see, yeah. 20, almost 20 years. Oh. Um, we came from Carbondale, where I got my Ph.D. in political science at Southern Illinois University, and Scott taught in the political science department there. And we started out living in Philo, and after about um, 12 years there, we found a place over on the Sangamon River and fell in love with it, and um, have that sort of become base camp for us, and we've been... Um, stewarding the Sangamon River over there, and that eventually led both of us to Prairie Rivers. And uh, last year, when Prairie Rivers was looking for a new executive director, Scott said, hey, you ought to apply for that. <laughs> and uh, so I did, and here I am. So I'm uh, about to celebrate my one-year anniversary as executive it, it, director. In the process, you, you mentioned that you're, you had parents that were interested in community activities. And right. My, my father went to the University of Chicago and in the late 60s and was the executive director of the Kenwood Hyde Park Community Council there for a couple of years, and where our president um, hails from. And... I learned at a very early age the value and importance of working with the community, working in the community, and the kind of change you can bring about when we all work together. I grew up watching that. My father, we eventually relocated to Atlanta, and he was executive director of um, the Northwest Georgia Girl Scout Council there, and he was planning director for the United Way of Greater Atlanta, and eventually took on child advocacy as his policy area, and I grew up watching that. I grew up, um, you know, with the folks leading change in Atlanta and uh, learned that from a, a very early age and then began doing that myself. And uh, for the past 15 years, I had my own consulting business working with states and communities across the country on youth um, prevention issues, so trying to keep youth healthy and really engage people in the community for healthy communities. And it was largely successful. So I bring that experience with me to water policy, working with Prairie Rivers. You also have two children. I do. We have two daughters. Um, one is at Kent State University, and she's studying economics. And the other one is at uh, UIC up in Chicago, and she's studying gender and women's studies and political science. Wow. Uh, and Scott, mm -hmm. I think we neglected to, to introduce you to to the people. So t tell us a little bit about your background. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm, I'm Scott Hayes, and I'm always amazed by Carol's uh, 
uh, truly an inspiration. And I, I just love rivers, and I grew up canoeing, kayaking, and everything else. And uh, I'm happy now to have been involved in forming the Upper Sangamon River Conservancy, uh, the organization that's been going since about 2009. And uh, we pretty much do everything that can be done on the Sangamon River. And I'm also a political scientist, very interested in, in policy and the policy that affects the environment uh, and community and love community work. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, oh. Water all around. Oh, oh. <laughs> so, uh, Okie Toby. Or, you know. Oh, yeah. Well, I spent many times canoeing overnight uh, in the Okefenokee Swamp uh, up in South Georgia and the Suwannee River and many of the springs of North Florida. So that's most of what I'm familiar with. I mean, people often think of the ocean and the beach, uh, but I love the fresh water, uh, the lakes, rivers, and everything else. Well, yeah, just while I'm thinking of it, uh, Ebert first has been on, and uh, they've had a couple of films that are rather interesting. And part of it is getting the people together, just as you've gotten together, and as your children get together, and as your parents get together. Right. Uh, is this, is, you, you don't have to invent the wheel. Yeah, often. Absolutely. You, 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 your parents are, are telling you to go this way. Well, I mean, something I really want to point out is that, you know, the work that, that we've been fortunate enough to be involved in um, is certainly not in isolation. And I wouldn't think I would do any of it if it weren't for community and volunteers and others being interested. And I think that's been a real key. I mean, you know, it certainly it's never a solo effort. It's like, is there something to be done? If there's something to be done, are there others who are interested? And so the group that we have, I mean, the Prairie Rivers Network has laid all kinds of groundwork in this community. And it's great to be involved with other people who are doing that. So, you know, and I think that's a real key. Were you here early enough that the seven hills of Philo were going to be a landfill? I No, I, I think no. we missed that. Yes. So, so it's a rather wonderful marinic seven hills. And so it's even though Philo doesn't have the river, it, it does have these hills. And uh, in there somewhere there was about a, a million, perhaps even $3 million spent on planning for a landfill. Uh, that never happened. It was well, that's good to know. It's, <laughs> you know, we, we um, Philo was a very old community, and people are very closely knit there, lots of families um, there. But in the time that we spent there, what I found very interesting, and I'd never lived on the prairie before, so not, not that we um, have what we would call a prairie anymore, but I was so amazed that I could wake up, you know, on a winter morning and look out and see for probably 10 miles unimpeded yes. across the, the landscape. Included, then. <laughs> Unbelievable to me. I'd never experienced that. Growing up in Atlanta, which is very green all year round, and you're, you know, always surrounded by trees. And to come here and experience, you know, the vastness of the sky and the landscape for a while, I, I described myself as being geographically challenged because I, the, the colors were not right, the landscape didn't look right to me, but I've learned over the time that I've been here to really appreciate the seasons and the, the change of the seasons and, you know, the unique nature of the landscape, the colors that come each year and the succession of colors. I'm an artist, um, that's what I do in, on the side, and for me, that's really striking is to get to know a place and what the landscape does, you know, visually uh -huh. each year. What do you do for art? How do you interpret? I paint. So I, I paint um, landscape. So I have a, a little sort of side thing. I call it Down the River Road, and it's art and photography. And I, I paint and take pictures of things that are just you, you see normally, you know, in the landscape Not here in the Midwest. everyone sees them. We have a little prairie across right. the street. Right, and we have a little prairie <laughs> yeah. across the street here. And, but that's, those are the kinds of things that I think are uniquely beautiful to this uh -huh. area, and we need to celebrate, and we have lost touch with those things. So, Well, if you came from Philo into town, you went over Yankee Ridge. That's right. And, and the Barnhart family has... Uh, at least 100 acres of, of prairie. Of uh, restored prairie there, that's right. What we don't have is anything left of the original prairie with all its microorganisms. And uh, you went down to probably 0.01% of correct. what was here. That's actually something we are focusing on at Prairie Rivers Network is thinking about not just 
what flows off the land into the water, you know, in terms of fertilizers and other chemicals that we are very concerned about, you know, pollutants in the water, but the soil itself, because healthy soil retains water appropriately yes. so that water doesn't run off of the land. So we need to rethink, you know, what we're doing to our soil and try, it's, it's a, it's not just an asset for a farmer, it is something for our food security that we need to be very concerned it's about. Genetic material for Absolutely. the rest of the world. If, Absolutely. If you're going to go around as a U.S. citizens and gather up glycine, which is the uh, botanical name for soybeans, and you're going to get a little two-inch plant from Saudi Arabia or something else from other countries, then you really need to have that sort of gene pool that those people can come and get. And so to have the genetics, the, the ecosystem almost extinct is, is really traumatic. It is. And, and even so, every week we find people digging up more of the original prairie. The only thing that's left is along the railroad lines where people weren't allowed that's to right. do it. They do it anyway. Right. But uh, that's all that's left of our original prairie. And you can reconstruct it to so however want you want and include more and more of the hundred species of broadleaf and things. But you could never recreate right. what has happened over 6,000 6, years and lightning strikes and all the rest of it and make it All the possible. natural disturbance yes. that's required, right. So we're very big into that. Uh, well, speaking of, speaking of areas along um, railroads, one of the projects that we're working on this year is um, monarch habitat. So along with all of the prairie plant species that we've lost, of course, all that diversity has gone the habitat for monarchs and other, you know, pollinating plants, nectar feeding, nectar feeding species. And the monarch is probably the one that we're most aware of. We're most aware of its decline. It's, it's a problem for, for farmers. It is. If, if you were age 90, you spent your day hours with a hoe. Pulling out milkweed, right? Pulling out milkweed. Right. So to talk to farmers about bringing hey, in milkweed. We want milkweeds, you to put this weed back in your... Uh... They also had to bring in uh, crops that would allow you to uh, have cattle calving early in the season. So, so those crops uh, among them is a wonderful crop for bees. But it's a, a really invasive, invasive crop. Invasive, right. Yellow clover, yellow and white sweet clover. And it was a very good hay crop for eight times a year. And uh, it costs us thousands and thousands of dollars to try and eliminate that invasive weed. But the, if you talk to the pollinator people, <laughs> they love it. So right. you've got a bit of balance and, and, and although it's not really legal to grow it on the roadside. There always seems to be a barn load of seed, and you see the recently reconstructed road, roadside, and there is a sweet clover. Well, you know what, what um, we're hoping, and, I, and I'm working with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources on a plan, statewide plan for monarch habitat. And our, our hope is that we can begin to restore um, adequate habitat. So part of the problem is that we don't have adequate numbers of milkweed stems, but where we do have them, they're disconnected. So monarchs need more connected habitat. They really prefer, there was a reason why they preferred those fields full of milkweed. They need more concentrated areas of milkweed and, and more um, diverse settings within fields. But what research is showing us is that if we have long stretches of area, like along rail beds and other rights of way, so areas um, underneath uh, power lines and along, uh, we have 18,000 miles of pipeline in yes. this state, 18,000 miles. That stretches three quarters away around the equator. And much of that area has rights of way along it, and those are other areas that would be ripe for uh, monarch habitat. So our hope is that by working with folks around the state that are themselves planting mil um, milkweed and other types of habitat for monarchs, we can reconnect some of these areas. So 
this is a big project for us this year. Then you have to work with people like Ameren that have right. uh, easements on, and they've discovered herbicide, and they no longer cut down the tree that would short to the ground. And, and so you can have a prairie that you've bought for its prairie. Right. And you all of a sudden lose it because they put on glycosides. Right. And they, oh, I think it's wonderful because they've got to, it's selective for grasses and the grasses grow, but the grasses are only one part of the that's prairie. That's right. Well, they, they have at least formed um, a group that's focused on rights of ways as habitat. So our hope is that we can begin to influence that. The big thing is that you have to have signage and you have to have maps within Ameren and uh, we don't have that. A, a, a dumb sign, which is big enough for someone to see, is $200 or $500. Uh, and so the subcontractors don't always get the message. And, and so you can have, uh, they wouldn't go through a cornfield and cut down the right. corn, but they would quite easily go through a prairie that looks like a bunch of weeds and, and destroy. So my, my hope is that those are the kinds of policies we can influence. Um, at Prairie Rivers, we, we focus a lot on policy, but we don't just think of legislative policy. We think of policies in private organizations, p policies in governmental organizations that make those kinds of on-the-ground decisions. Yes, and you have to be sure that some of this material, you, you're getting money from trusts to do something, but sometimes the trust is a trust that reduces its tax base. Uh, and 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 they don't, you don't have any voting behavior to to, to get money from right. the supporting organizations. Right. So that's a little cruel if you if you're looking at the one percent that's doing a lot of the organization at that level. Uh, we have to balance the the herbicide and the money that comes in for it and the tax base. Uh, it's complex, and I'm it glad is. you have a political science base. <laughs> well, and this is one of the reasons why Prairie Rivers is a membership organization, because we depend on our members and their donations to help us do the kind of work that we can't look to or don't want to look to foundations to support. So, for example, this Monarch yes. work is work that we're relying on donors to help us support. So, uh, how do you convince the College of Agriculture, which is very much organized around GMOs, to put in filter strips of, of contoured prairie? It's, it's, it's challenging. Can, it is challenging. It costs someone. Yep. How do you say that this moraine is gravelly and you can put irrigation on it and the irrigation is pulling out of an aquifer that's clean and tidy and, and wow, you could almost get two crops a year. So you have one foot very nearly in the university and you have associated professors and the like. How do you work this political atmosphere? Well, it's, it is a challenge and we, um, we try to work both from the inside, so we are currently a, an active stakeholder in the Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy, which is the Illinois response to the US EPA about how we're going to deal with agricultural runoff. 80% um, of the non-point source pollution that runs into waters in this state comes from agriculture and that's predominantly fertilizer agriculture. Um, the other stakeholders are essentially, you know, the producer groups, um, the Farm Bureau, and um, the Fertilizer Council. We're all at the table, and our job is to figure out how to work together to build a plan that can improve water in this state. Our job at that table is to constantly ask the tough questions yes. and to push the conversation um, and to push the, the process so that 10 years from now we're not sitting here having the same conversation. We're hoping that enough change will take place 
uh, at various levels, including at the, you know, the actual field level itself, um, that, that we'll be having a different conversation. Will the problem be solved? No. This is a very long-term This is a very problem. young yes. country. <laughs> it's like six generations old, which is very young. It is. And many of the people that came here were either entrepreneurs or peasants. And, and they've had to learn how to drain the land and work it. And not always has there been a sympathy for the soil. It has more been that we need money to do things. And so money has been a, a big and, You know, and driver. the soil has been, you know, just, um, it, it, it's in some ways like gold. You know, it's another resource to be extracted and utilized. And the, the what we haven't understood um, I think I think earlier generations of farmers innately understood it, but what we haven't really appreciated is that uh, the soil is a living host of millions of microorganisms, yes. and um, just like we have to protect, you know, the health of our body, we have to, and we protect the health of our animals, we have to protect the health of all those microorganisms because that's what you know, brings new life. So. It often requires a, a sympathy of the adjacent farmer. Uh, we have railroad bed that's about 100 feet wide with a ballast in the middle of it. And it's very tempting to, for someone to, to turn their equipment on that 100 feet. And that creates a, a sort of badger situation which is fertilized and, and disturbed. And, and there and grows ragweed. The, mm -hmm. the, the ragweed. And then there's a temptation to mow the ragweed. And I'm saying, no, you created this on our cons conservation site. And bless me, the next step is they digged it up. Right. And, and so the you, 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 next thing is to herbicide it and to fertilize it. And bingo goes uh, 60 years of work to preserve this corridor. So, so, so the, 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 well, you're very right. You need the people. You need the numbers of people. And they have to be fairly well educated. They do well. But they can't be just digging up uh, 200 sh shopping carts out of the boneyard. Right. It has to be uh, on one, on students. One day a year. <laughs> yes. You know, and that I think that's really the challenge that you know an organization like USRC and Prairie Rivers Network is constantly confronted with is how do we engage people for the long term? How do we get them? you know, in the door to begin with, and then, um, you know, actively doing things that both they feel rewarded to do, so they want to come back and do it yes. again. You can't just have them filing files. Right. But, but then they want to do it again and again, or we find other opportunities for them. What I've learned over my, you know, almost 20 years now of working with organizations is that, you know, people get tired and they get tired of doing the same thing and let it, unless it is your lifelong passion. And most people who volunteer have many other things that they need to do in their lifetime, you know, in their, their daily lives. And the thing that is your passion may not be their, you know, That's daily true. passion. So you have to figure out a way to both engage them in something that they're good at and they want to do, but then to refresh the organization. So you have enough new people coming into the organization that you're building their leadership so they can take on those things in the future. It's you always have to be looking ahead. Yes, you're sitting in a WEFT radio station, <laughs> which has been going for 30 years and it's absolutely amazing, but it has some of those same problems. If you're gonna talk about ar archiving things and David who has, is involved in that, you have to have enough knowledge to know uh, what the pixels are. What right. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and we don't have those sorts of people. And there are fewer people, and they have to look after their, not only their parents, but their grandparents. Right. They have to find out this very active thing of what sort of music do they have. The streets of Champagne last night were absolutely loaded with young people. There's, it, it was a EBIT fest right. too, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, and some of that was very good. Uh, uh, mentioned before th that there's uh, nuns on the bus. The, the the this was a film about a group of Catholic women who didn't want to be necessarily robed 
uh, so that they were separate and different. They got out of their habits and they started to do things and then they started to think politically, what could they do? And they end up in Rome asking questions of the church and and how it is administered. And and so this brings in young people that would want to take a, make a film about the, 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 the leading nun who's now passed, but she was very had a very good sense of humor. She got hold of people from prisons and other places and worked on it. And gradually they had an organization in the Chicago area that looked after poverty people. Then they got the people who were thinking of the political side of things and, and taking it further. And a busload of nuns was very interesting and exciting and it went across the country and it's still going across the country. <laughs> and. Uh, so then to, for someone who wasn't a Catholic to come in and film that uh, and, and then ask questions of people who were in the church, like someone who had an Italian background. And, and so we're talking about it, people problems. It's not peculiar to the US. It's been going on since pagan times in oh, Europe sure. and other places and, and the, uh, Southeast Asia and wherever. Uh, I'm Australian and goes back to... Uh, Aboriginals that bridged mm -hmm. from from India and through. Uh, so, how do we? Uh, well, you know, I think what what you're pointing to though is a is really important when you think about creating change, and that is seldom does change the kinds of change we're talking about here happen in a short period of time. Change tends to be evolutionary. Yes that frustrates some people who want to make change because they think if they get involved, they can make a difference in a very quick sure. way, right? Yes. And then get frustrated when they don't. And, uh, you know, I think it's, there, there are opportunities to make change quickly. And, and I believe, you know, if you look at the changes that have come about in um, areas related to gay marriage, for example, that was a rather fast change, and they they it was um, very well coordinated. It was very strategic in the way they brought, you know, sort of different pieces to play. It was a multi-level strategy, but they were very intentional about it. And often the the types of arenas that we're working in. You don't have the opportunity for that sort of coordination. Scott and I, when, when we first moved here, um, we got a grant together from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to study the adoption of clean and door air ordinances and other types of tobacco control ordinances across the country. And we traveled to 20 cities around the country that had recently made changes in one way or another uh, many of them had adopted clean and or air ordinances locally, and we wanted to understand how they made that happen. What brought that about? How long did it take? Who was involved? What kind of pathway did it take? And, you know, we discovered that there are sort of some essential steps in that, um, some essential ingredients, but the, the catalyst for it varied. So it really sort of depended upon um, where the interest in the ordinance came yes, from originally and and who locally really stimulated that um, but across all of those examples all of those cases in in no place was it a very large group of people it was always a small group um, that you know came together because somebody was disaffected you know often lost a loved one or or something like that in relation to um, you know smoking and we realized that, you know, you really can, that adage that it takes a small group of people, don't ever underestimate the power yes. of a small group of people. That's really what it takes. It does take, though, thoughtful coordination and working together, you know, and not uh, often I have this image of, you know, the, the classic cat herd where people are going in a lot of different directions at the same time. There's been about 10 attempts uh, by people who of substance to pull together the environmental groups in this community. It's very challenging uh, it, to do. It, Everybody has their own agenda they're working on. Yes. And they're all going in different directions. And they're all doing good things. You know, we don't, we don't want to say nobody's doing a good thing. 
But when you bring that power together and for a common purpose, often you can accelerate policy change, you know, in a way that you would not have expected. But it's that coming, it's what's, what catalyzes that, what brings that together, you know, so that everybody can um, sort of join forces for a period of time to accomplish something that they all want to accomplish That's together. That's a little bit happening with the Prairie State Conservation Coalition. It's about 10 years old, it's working at the state level, sometimes uh, more than a state level, but th they're looking at policies. Uh, when they lost uh, money for people who would get subsidized for having a forest, mm -hmm. then those people started to harvest the forest. Uh, so that that's an attempt to get that sort of regulation back. Right. Uh, and and some of the power comes from downstate, but a lot of it comes from the Chicago area where there's uh, political clout and and uh, and finance to do things. And so so this organization uh, uh, has gone for about ten years. Uh, Fran Harty is a, a local person who's right. in uh, Nature Conservancy. And uh, he's been the leader of the push and gradually got people together so that they open lands in Chicago and other groups uh, get together and do something and they have webinars and, and uh, e educate people about uh, what they might be able to do. Uh, and I didn't attend it, but the 7th of April was a, a lobby day in, in, in Springfield. And we were advised that that was a better lobby day than than another lobby day. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we're getting messages, and, and that's very very that's helpful. Uh, that's great. Uh, so I had and, and you're talking about uh, butterflies. Uh, I am I'm, I'm a little bit more oriented to all butterflies, not just there's, there's two thousand different insects out there. That's right. Some of them you can't even see with a with a hand lens. They're so small, uh, but uh, w w we look for something more broad. We have an old road between uh, uh, Rantoul and Paxton that is an old concrete road. By mandate, the culverts have been taken out because the culverts are regarded as something that's li libelous. So, so uh, that corridor is parallel to an old 40, uh, new 45. And, and it's loaded with prairie all the way to, to Paxton, so just 10 miles. And that, I think, would be a marvelous place to, to have a, a national park that would, you'd get off at Kankakee, come down through the Kankakee Sands and a different ecology, uh, come down to Loda where there's a cemetery prairie and the Grand Prairie Friends has been working with a uh, buffer zone on the outside of it. and. Then you come to Paxton, and there's a Paxton Cemetery, which is really a very nice cemetery. Uh, you have to prevent the, the the cultural people who think it ought to be mown uh, from doing that at the wrong time. But then you, you get to be, have this corridor, the 10 miles, and it goes up over the Bloomington Moraine and down. So we, mm. we, we have a little prairie on the Mesic side, but we need a little piece of the upland uh, area where there is dry uh, loose from mm -hmm. blown across from the Air Illinois River and and then you go down and you go this, you have to imagine at some stage there may have been 200 feet of ice sitting there and dribbling out the the boulders and stones and glacial tilt <coughs> from Canada very very rich soil and then you go down and there's 15 acres of ground there we would love to buy uh, and, and and also there's a cemetery which has all the history and we'd like to buy that as uh, as a, an example of wetland. It's too wet to be used for agriculture. But I, uh, the next thing that's going to happen is it's going to have 250 million ton of soil sitting there and there'll be a Walmart sitting yes. on top of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you look at a, a project like that, and there's, there's dozens of those sorts of projects. Well, actually, that's a good question, and um, we have some funding from uh, a funder to 
find those kinds of conservation opportunity areas is the way oh, that we think about it. Oh, we've got another one for you. It's just 33 miles of railroad that's so, going from, from Monticello to Clinton. And uh, yes, we want to get to it before we have people dig it up to the soil. So we're... Um, one of one of the folks on my staff, Elliot Brinkman, is leading that project, and it's a um, a a collaboration with a number of land trusts and other land organizations that are uh, working together. And and we were talking earlier about the power of working together. And usually those groups don't work together actively. They they each have their own projects. They're very busy. They have their own missions and agendas. But they're finding that there is power working together to find those kinds of opportunity areas and prioritize them and try to protect them. So that's something that, that we're becoming pretty active in. Um, oh, that, so finding those, uh, those types of pro the, the challenges that, while you know about them, other, not everybody knows about them. So, so finding them, figuring out where they are, and how, what's the best strategy to get them into conservation is important. That's why we have a WEFT. That's and, right. <laughs> and, and we're out there, and, and we've got 85 one-hour programs up on YouTube. Uh, so, yeah, I forgot myself. Oh, we have another one. We, we've created a, a historic railroad, and we want to re-rail four miles of our land, uh, and then there's an abandonment of three miles. This is between White Heath and Bonville. And, and so at the moment, we are working to try and retain the active line. There's two elevators, two different companies uh, there. The price has been put up. Canadian National doesn't want to uh, have these decapitated main lines with two rinky-dink uh, elevators on it. They want 100 cars at once. So, so uh, the talent is to, to be working with the, the Rail Banking Act at the federal level to service transportation board, to work at a state level, to find out where the stakeholders are, who are the farmers on the side which would just like to take over that that land that has the uh, virgin underneath the ballast, there's, a, there's good territory. And and so, yes, that sort of thing involves... Well, that, that reminds me of, of something that Scott and I have talked about um, at length, and we, we have our morning coffee time from six to seven where we, you know, sort of dream about what could we do if, right, you know. So um, we're leading a group where we live out in Muhammad. We, we live on yes. the Sangamon River but not in the village, um, and we're designing a river trail. So it's a trail that would go along the Sangamon, particularly in the village, and the goal is to, to uh, connect the village with the river, and people have really come to value the river, see it as um, not just an asset in the community, but something that they want to engage in, and I attribute that to the work that the USRC has done. And we've talked about, um, as part of that trail, that it would be connected to a longer bike trail in that area of the county. And we're in the area that you're talking about. Two miles of it has been put into a trail at Monticello. Right. It's very, very popular. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And increasingly, that's what people the, want. They want longer stretches of trail. They want to be able to get out and walk or ride their bike. Um, they want it to be, you know, within a short distance of where they live so they can easily go for part of a day and enjoy it and then, you know, come back and do what they need to. They don't want to have to, I mean, the, the Katy Trail is over in Missouri, but, you know, people don't want to travel that far. They want to be able to access it close Local. to home and more frequently. And it hasn't been very popular in, in East Central Illinois because right. they have very rich soils. And that everybody wants to, you know, plant in or pave over, unfortunately. But here's an opportunity to really, you know, I think advance people's desire to be outdoors, but also the, you know, from a public, so I think of this from a public health perspective too, that exercise. the exercise, right, people are wanting ways to get better exercise, but, but in a more natural environment. And we know too from research that's going on at U of I that the natural environment is probably the best antidote to mental health issues like depression. Just being outside and yeah. being exposed to trees and nature can do things that, you know, um, 
even just exercise indoors or, or taking pharmaceuticals can't accomplish. So sure. these are all important reasons for us to get back outside and enjoy the outdoors and to create these kinds of trails. There's another probably 30 miles between Muhammad and uh, Bloomington. Right. It, 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 uh, right. And a lot of it is, is still in rail and, and uh, it could be a, an interim trail use uh, but that would mean w w running a bicycle trail down amongst the trees that have grown in this retired railroad. But you s have to know that there's Chicago and St. Louis and Bloomington is in the middle and this is a connection to Indianapolis and we're just putting in a trail which is an interim trail use, can come back to rail. Uh, and that doesn't uh, excite uh, recreational people. And then we have another problem is if we want to get through Champaign on the banks of a, a railroad line, uh, then you're going to go through a non-affluent community. And uh, traditionally, the bikers and the hikers are fairly affluent people. So how do you, how do you deal with the rest of that crowd? Um. I think we do that by showing that um, the kinds of things that we have in common unite us, they don't separate us. And everyone has the same kinds of um, desires and uh, by doing these kinds of projects it improves not just um, the health of the people who are wanting to use them, it improves those neighborhoods too. So everybody benefits from those kinds of projects. Rather than thinking it's only for us, we need to think it's for all of us. Clint Lindsay, who was uh, in charge of the recycling center here when there was a recycling center, uh, took photo uh, cameras and, and photographed a, a line that went through Indianapolis. And, and almost all the users were fairly affluent people. There were the poverty community that was on the side were doing wheelies with bicycles but it was a totally different bicycle plan and it didn't involve movement across and we've had rail trails we had a plank rail trail in Chicago from South uh, Park Forest South uh, through uh, it started with an affluent community at one end and a non-affluent community at the other end and it was approved and funded and rescinded and re it went on for for years because of that sort of distance between the haves and the have-nots. Mm -hmm. uh, uh. I think it's important to listen to communities, to listen to people in neighborhoods and what their needs are. So when I, um, one of the um, projects that I did as an extension of the research that Scott and I had with a, a coalition in, um, in Michigan that was working in a, uh, an affluent neighborhood that had um, an impoverished neighborhood next door. And they couldn't figure out how to connect to that impoverished neighborhood because they wanted them to join their efforts. So they, they finally decided they would go talk to them, which seems like that would have been a great first step, uh, and said, what, what can we do to, you know, to to get you to work with us. And they said, well, you know, what we're really concerned about isn't, um, you know, people smoking in restaurants and bars. What we're concerned about is do we have a stop sign at the end of the, at, you know, at this very busy road so that our kids can cross the street from our neighborhood to the playground, you know, across yes. the very busy road to play so they can be safe. So their concerns were completely different than what this coalition was trying to accomplish. So they together worked to put in stop signs and crosswalks so that kids could get to the neighborhood and play safely. Well, that developed a trusting relationship between the two communities, and they found that they had more in common than what they thought they did. And they were then able to work together on other projects that benefited everybody. Yes. You know, so, so part of it is how do we not think of neighborhoods as something to get through on the way to someplace else, but how do we work with them to understand what you know their needs and priorities are too? They you know they've got kids that want to be safe, who want to be healthy. They've got adults who want to be outside and and enjoy a safe environment, and 
you know, be healthy themselves. We, those are all universal issues, universal concerns. Having clean water is a universal concern. How can we do that together so that um, even where affluent communities have a louder voice, they are heard more often, they can have their needs often met more quickly, but how can we have a process that's inclusive so that we're focusing on the needs of underserved communities, marginalized communities as well in the process? So we're talking to Carol Hayes and, and uh, Scott Hayes. They're both environmentalists and died in the wool environmentalists, and so they have poli-sci backgrounds, so they can uh, help us organize for the future. And uh, it, it's, 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 it's very, very challenging, and uh, we, we really appreciate you, you being, being here. Uh, you were talking about the speed with which we can do this. Does it take six generations to change something? But it's amazing, you were talking about smoking. It's, it has changed. Uh, in a fairly short time. Well, it took 40 years, so yeah. that is a long time from but, the from the time that we first understood that smoking was unhealthy. Yes. But that's a short time. Generally, in my reading. yeah. Uh, the women didn't have a vote in 1923, and they've come God knows how long, and I think the men have got to be catching up. Uh, so, what what's the status of women in your your thought process? Uh, do, do, do you have the little old ladies in tennis shoes? Or do you have someone with a degree? And, and is that degree a monolithic so they have a, a, a detail? A, 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 where do we have this general horizontal interaction? Can we get a degree for not discovering uh, something that's a Nobel Prize winning event? We, we need community action. And I think there ought to be PhDs that are, are good for that sort of organizing. How well, sure. Um, so the, the interesting thing about the environmental movement is, um, you know, once it kind of moved from just sheer activism, working for laws like the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act in the early 70s, um, that that became federal law and then also became adopted at the state level. But the federal laws often don't have any T's in them. So, so. They, well, they're designed, it's interesting, I was talking to Scott about this this morning, you know, they're really designed um, to have the, the role that citizens play is a watchdog role. So in order to enforce them, you have to use the regulatory arena and you have to use the courts. Both of those are very arcane. They're all about, you know, very specific rules, how laws are carried out, or enforcing uh, rules through the permitting process. And you and I, just, you know, regular citizens, it's very challenging for us to be actively involved in those arenas. It's expensive. You can um, lose, lose your life. You, you, in, you, in can, you, you can certainly lose your fortune <laughs> very quickly trying as a citizen to, um, to fight in those arenas. So organizations like Prairie Rivers Network um, and the Natural, Natural, Natural Resources Defense Council, the Environmental Defense Fund, and, and scores of legal clinics around the country who, um, you know, train... Um, environmental lawyers to enforce these laws and that is essentially the way that they've been enforced now since the early 70s is, is through those. So Prairie Rivers has an attorney on staff who is actually a woman um, and she works with other attorneys to help do that kind of watchdog enforcement for us but we work with um, attorneys uh, in Chicago and in other states to, you know, sort of um, work to enforce the Clean Water Act, for example. And we just had a, um, you may be aware that there was a rather large fight that's still going on over the Clean Water Act and what do we mean by the waters of the United States, what are those waters, uh, and simply trying to apply the Clean Water Act to the, you know, original definition of what the waters of the U.S. are. 
So that, that's been a fight that we've been involved with for the past couple of years, um, just you know, clarifying what should be protected. So when you ask, so what's the, you know, what's the professional trajectory for somebody who wants to do this work? And I think that's been the challenge for the movement is that because we have professionalized, and it's wonderful that we have, we have, in my organization, um, I have folks um, that, that work at Prairie Rivers that have a, a broad skill set. So we have um, folks that actually have biology and, and natural science backgrounds, um, folks who are political science, have political science degrees, law degrees. Um, so we try to have a variety of skills because we address a number of policy issues and we have to be prepared to be able to do that. And um, doing research, working with researchers, we're not, we don't have a research staff, but we um, work with researchers on campus and in other places. Yeah. Without that, it would be very difficult to do this work. But we need people who are, um, you mentioned grandmothers in tennis shoes, in, and those grandmothers in tennis shoes, those are the folks that fought for these laws to begin with, you know, that began fighting in the 60s and really brought it home, you know, um, uh, demanding that we protect our air and our water when rivers were on fire in the late 60s and early 70s. Those are the grandmas in tennis shoes now, and they are still very active, and they, they're the ones that, that will get on the bus on Environmental Lobby Day that's coming up later this month on the 21st and go to Springfield and say, you know, we still need to protect our water and our air. We need, um, you know, we need to protect the health of, of uh, our prairies and we need to protect our wildlife. They are the ones who still regularly do that work. But we also need young people, and it's exciting to see on campus uh, recently, um, the University of Illinois, the um, you know the the academic senate voted to uh, recommend divesting from coal, and one of our staff at Prairie Rivers took a lead in that as a student, and that took four years to accomplish. So, having young people engaged and bringing the next generation along, whether they're going to you know, have professionally be an environmentalist and work for an environmental organization or they just, you know, those are their values and ethics and they want to make sure that they're protecting the planet for themselves and their own children. Everybody needs to engage, be engaged, but everybody can be engaged. There's room for everybody in this movement. There's room for everybody to do something positive, whether it's at home because they're, I know you mentioned uh, um, you're concerned about recycling, whether it's recycling and making sure that we have recycling available and, and strong recycling programs, or it's teaching, you know, uh, talking about the importance of climate change and what we can all do to make a difference. Everybody can do something. Let, let me look at my watch because uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't want to leave you without giving some uh, summary of your organization so that you, uh, coming up Earth Day, and, and so you may need to, to announce yourself. So have you got a little statement to make about what you do, why? Uh, there's some of the brackets. We've sure. been talking about them generally. But I don't want to leave the program without giving you a chance to, to, to uh, tell us what, so, what you do. So Prairie Rivers Network um, is, has been in this community for almost 50 years. Um, next year we will celebrate our 50th anniversary and Prairie Rivers came about because some people got concerned that they were going to put a dam on the Sangamon River at Allerton Park and flood, flood that beautiful area, that we would lose the beauty of that park, we would lose the fertility of that land. And so they, um, they worked together tirelessly for a number of years with the farming community to save Allerton Park and that's where Prairie Rivers got its start. Since then, we have worked on uh, removing dams. We have worked on um, protecting habitat corridors along rivers. We've worked with watersheds to help them organize and plan to improve the health of, of the watershed and of the streams and rivers that flow through them. We have fought um, CAFOs, um, you know, contained animal feeding operations that are popping up all over the state. It's a very challenging issue. We've been working on point source pollution from sewage treatment plants and non-point source pollution from agriculture. 
Uh, we have a program working on invasive species up in Chicago uh, to try to keep carp out of Lake Michigan, uh, also a very challenging issue. Um, and we're, we have a very active coal program, so we work to stop a coal mine and, and are continuing to try to work on that. We've, we succeeded with one coal mine over a little west of us. We're working on the one that's up uh, in, in the Vermilion County area. Bulldog Mine, which I'm sure listeners are familiar with, and so far we don't have a mine there, so we're uh, we're continuing to count that as as a success, as are all of the property owners over there who work tirelessly on that project. We're very concerned about coal ash pits all over the state. There are 80 of them. Um, they are next to large power plants. Uh, we're worried about the the coal industry as it goes into decline. That um, the you know the power Stations that use coal will also uh, find themselves um, similarly financially challenged. Uh, we have been working on uh, regulations to close those pits in a way that is responsible so that they don't leak like they have done in, in various places out east. We have one here in particular on the Middle Fork that we're concerned about that, that is leaking, and we are aware of that. Um, that's going to be a very challenging thing for the state, and we want to make sure that the state isn't left holding the bag paying to clean up those pits. So that's another active program that we have. Generally, we're, um, we work to protect the health of the streams and rivers in the state and the drinking water that um, many of those rivers are the supply for. There are 50 watersheds in this state, and 49 of them eventually make their way to the Mississippi River. And the Mississippi River and the, the um, fertilizer pollution coming from Illinois is a major contributor to the hypoxic zone, which is the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. And so much of the work that we do is collaborating with Mississippi River states um, that are, uh, you know, all the states along the Mississippi that are facing similar problems and trying trying to deal with this. So we collaborate. Mo much of our work is in collaboration with other groups. Just out of curiosity, where is the one watershed that doesn't go into the Mississippi? Mm -hmm. I Chicago, because oh, uh, like, like just Michigan? north of Chicago, oh. yeah, that, that um, area does flow into Lake Michigan. Aha, uh -huh. interesting. We're down to the last minute. Do you guys have, you must have a website. If people want more information, we where do, do they go? It's prairierivers.org. And we have a blog there that we post um, about our work regularly. We're also on Facebook, so please like us on Facebook. And we're on Twitter. Uh, we have an active Twitter campaign going on, and we would love to have people join us to um, protect uh, uh, a wetland, a floodway on the Mississippi that's over in Missouri, the New Madrid uh, floodway. And so please join us on Twitter on Thursdays where we're actively tweeting to protect that. Cool. And Dave? where are you located? You used to be in McKinley. We now are you're down. Uh, we on are Devonshire. over on in uh, on Fox Drive in the Devonshire office complex, and uh, right here in Champaign. And we would welcome volunteers if folks would like to volunteer with us. Any last words, Dave? We're into yes, this, overtime. So thank you, Carol. Hayes and she did a great job. <laughs> you can, you can <laughs> see my show from last week. Uh, Scott, Scott Hayes. <laughs> so yes, uh, it's very good to, to have you here, and, and we'll have you back again sometime. Thank I'm you. Sure. So thank you. This has been Dave Monk, your Prairie Monk, WEFT Champagne 90.1 on your FM dial. And Dave on the board. And as always, the views and opinions expressed are solely those of the speakers and nobody else. It is noon, and that means it is time now for. Shruti, Music of India, we're going to get things started with music of Ali Akbar Khan. <laughs>